This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory of Alan, Mark, and Karen Raffi. May their souls be elevated in heaven. The cavalcade of reviews for the Parsha podcast keep coming in. This week's review is courtesy of a listener named Daniel, who left this very kind review of the Parsha podcast on Apple Podcasts. Quote, Rabbi Wolby is amazing. Three exclamation points. He's well-learned, pleasant to listen to, knows so much amazing tone information that he can easily explain in a simple format, but with a deep level of understanding. So glad he is helping me grow in my knowledge of Judaism and enhancing my relationship with the Almighty. Thank you so much, Daniel, for this review. It was so thoughtful of you to leave it, and I am so touched by your feedback. This week we have something special. I saw a fabulous piece in my new favorite book that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Svas Emes. I actually saw two amazing pieces, and each one on its own to be its own podcast. And I toyed with doing both of them. But I decided to spare y'all for that for a few reasons. First of all, I thought the podcast would be a little too long. And second of all, because there is so much meat on the bone in the idea that we're going to share today, that it's enough to focus just on what we're going to talk about today. And of course, I want to save something for next year. This is the fifth year of the Parsha podcast, and please God, the Almighty will give us the strength and the ability to continue doing this for many years. I want to leave something for next year. So here it is. This week is Parshas Acharimos and Kedoshim. And this is part of a stretch in the Torah where we're going to have three out of four weeks are going to be double installments of Parshas. So Parshas Achramos and Kedoshim is our week's Parsha or double Parsha. And in chapter 18 of the book of Leviticus, and this is in the first Parsha, it details a long list of activities and behaviors and abominable acts and sexual crimes and idolatry and child sacrifice that we must not do. And it begins with a preamble that reads as follows. Hashem is supposed to say, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Hashem your God. Do not perform the practice of the land of Egypt in which you dwelled, and do not perform the practice of the land of Canaan to which I bring you, and do not follow their traditions. Carry out my laws and safeguard my decrees to follow them. I am Hashem your God. You shall observe my decrees and my laws, which man shall carry out and by which he shall live. I am Hashem. These five verses, the first five verses of chapter 18, they give us this introduction of all the laws that ensue. And it proceeds to delineate all the forbidden relationships and all the forbidden deeds one after another. Now, Rashi, with his characteristic eagle-eyed reading of the verse, he notices something really interesting in verse number three. The verse says, Do not perform the practice of the land of Egypt in which you have dwelt, and do not perform the practice of the land of Canaan to which I will bring you, and don't follow their traditions. So Rashi points out that all the things that are going to be described, all these forbidden activities, all these sins, all these transgressions that are going to be described later on in the chapter, that was the practice of the Egyptians. Of course, the Jewish people just left Egypt and just departed from the Egyptians. And it's also the ways of the Canaanites to which the Jewish people are going. Rashi notices, it doesn't just say that, it says something more. Do not perform the practice of the land of Egypt in which you dwelled. Those words are extra. Asher yashavtem ba. And do not perform the practice of the land of Canaan to which I will bring you. Asher ani mevi eschem shama. Says Rashi, something really interesting. The Egyptians and the Canaanites are the worst nations of all the nations. They're the most morally corrupt, the most sinful of all the nations. But it's not just that. Specifically the area in Egypt where the Jewish people lived that contained the worst of the Egyptians, they were the Jewish people's neighbors when the Jewish people lived in Egypt. And then in Canaan, Canaan in general, along with Egypt, 
it's the worst nation of all, and the specific area in which the Jewish people are going to live, that contained the worst of all the Canaanites. And therefore the verse says, do not perform the practice of the land of Egypt in which you have dwelt, i.e. the area specifically where you have dwelt, and don't perform the practice of the land of Canaan to which I will bring you specifically to the location where you are heading towards. That's what Rashi says here. And it's kind of an amazing idea that the most corrupt and morally deficient nations of the whole world, they were precisely the nations that our people lived in their proximity. And not only that, specifically where we lived, that contained the worst of the worst, that is where the most evil, the most sinful people lived right as neighbors to us. And this, of course, creates a stark contrast. We have our nation armed with Torah and supposed to be at least the most moral and righteous and upstanding of the nations. And we're always going to be placed next to the worst of the worst, the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And not just any ordinary Egyptians or Canaanites. Oh no, the worst of the Egyptians and the worst of the Canaanites, the people that embodied the sins delineated in chapter 18, those are our neighbors. And the Midrash here adds some color to this insight. The Midrash says that the Almighty tells Moshe, go tell the Jewish people, when you were in Egypt, you were akin to a rose amidst thorns. You have a beautiful rose, the most beautiful of all the flowers, and the stem, of course, is covered in thorns. And now, continues God to Moshe to tell the Jewish people, now you're entering the land of Canaan, again, you should be similar to a rose amidst thorns. And be certain that you do not adopt, not the characteristic, not the behavior of the Egyptians, and not the characteristics or the behaviors of the Canaanites. So this is the idea here featured as an introduction to all the forbidden behaviors and relationships and deeds and sins that are delineated in chapter 18. The introduction is, this was the practice of the Egyptians, who were your neighbors, and this is the practice of the Canaanites, who are going to be your neighbors. And the question could be raised, why indeed are we always placed near the absolute worst of the worst, the worst nation, and the worst sect among those nations? And what is the lesson behind this phenomenon? So I want to read you a piece in the Svas Emes, and this is characteristically short, 193 words, but as usual, he's just dropping bombs one after another. Each sentence is a new insight, a new idea. I want to read it, go through with it, and then we're going to unpack it. Because by my count, there are at least eight life-changing insights packed into this short piece. And he says that the idea behind this is that always the Jewish people always face resistance. There's always headwinds facing us, challenging us, and stopping us, or preventing us, or creating an obstacle for us to overcome. And that's why we were created, to fix all these places. The money sent us to Egypt, because that's where the worst of the worst were, and the money sent us to Canaan, because that's where the most morally deficient people are, because we are the ones who are going to fix it. And this is something which is true both on a communal level as it is on an individual level. Just as every individual Jew has no rest, must always be proactive, must always be conquering the next big thing. Just as the Talmud tells us that in the future, when the Almighty is going to slaughter the Yetzahara, the evil condition in front of the righteous and the wicked, the Talmud in the book of Sukkah, page 52a, tells us that when the righteous see the Yetzahara being slaughtered, 
it's going to appear to them to be like an insurmountable mountain. No matter how often you conquer the Eight Sahara, there's a new challenge awaiting for you. You never suppress the mountain. You can never reduce the challenge because you're always proactive. There's always a new frontier to conquer. And that's true by the individuals. And it's also true amongst the Jewish people. So they might send us to Egypt because it was a difficult place, because it contained the lowest levels of impurity. And he sent us there to fix it. Continues as Fasemes. And it appears to me that the impurity of Egypt was in idolatry, whereas the impurity of Canaan is with matters of licentiousness. And the Jewish people, we leave Egypt. And what happens? On a spiritual level, that is equivalent to us overcoming the great challenge that was living in proximity to the Egyptians. And what happens when we leave? We've overcome this great challenge. Well, that is going to yield a great benefit as a result. And therefore, we leave Egypt, and right away, we get the Torah. The Torah is like the reward for the overcoming, for the successful conquest, the spiritual conquest of perfecting or fixing the flaws, the maladies that were present in the land of Egypt. We conquered that goal. We achieved that mission. And the man says, okay, here's your reward. Here's Torah. And then we get to Canaan and we're successful or moderately successful in that conquest. And we earn the land of Israel and we earn the Holy Temple. And then he points out that the conquest of Egypt was a complete and permanent one. While the conquest of Canaan was incomplete. In fact, if you look at the book of Joshua and the book of Judges, they didn't fully conquer Canaan. There were some pockets of resistance that remained. And that's indicative on a spiritual level that the mission, the, the mission Canaan, so to speak, to perfect it from its flaws, that was not completed. Whereas the mission of Egypt Whatever we needed to accomplish in Egypt, it was done in totality. It was done by Moshe. And therefore, the gift, so to speak, that we get as a result of Egypt, because the conquest of Egypt was complete, therefore the gift was also complete and was also permanent and it endured. So the Torah endured. We never lost the Torah. Whereas the conquest of Canaan, that mission, was not completely finished. And therefore, the temple that we got as a result, it was not permanent either. It was not complete, and the temple was able to be destroyed. And then he adds that in the war of Sichon and Og, which we talk about in the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy, that conquest, that related to a third sin, namely that of murder. And we know that there are three cardinal sins for which we must forfeit our lives to not transgress. Idolatry, adultery, and all the related sins, licentiousness, promiscuity, and of course, murder. And these three biddies, the three cardinal sins, they correspond to Egypt, Sichon and Og, and of course, Canaan. And then he tells us something fascinating, and I'm going to repack this all together. It's going to make sense because he's speaking very quickly in short little bursts. And we're going to really unpack it, hopefully, in just a little bit. Then he says like this. Today, we are in what's called the exile of Edom. Edom, that's the last frontier. Egypt, we finished. Canaan, we finished. Sichon and Og, we finished. And now we have the last conquest, and that is that of Edom. 
which is Esav. And the sin that corresponds to this current and final challenge, that is the sins of senseless hatred from one Jew to another, and Lashon Hara, evil talk. And these sins, we're told, are equal to all three cardinal sins because this kingdom is equal to all three other kingdoms. Thus concludes this amazing piece in the Svasemis. And let's unpack it. And like I said earlier, there are eight distinct ideas that he mentions in his piece. So the verse tells us that we must not act not like the Egyptians and not like the Canaanites, because they were the worst. And they were the ones who really embodied these sins. And the Svastamas tells us, idea number one, is that we will always face resistance. The defining characteristic of our people and us as individuals is that we have resistance. We face challenges. We have missions to accomplish. We'd love maybe to have the easy life. But you know what? It's too late. I'm sorry. The ship has sailed. We should even say that Abraham's primary achievement is that he set us on an irrevocable course to greatness. The concept of us being average, being okay, being mediocre, being nothing wrong but nothing too great, that ship has sailed. Mediocrity is impossible. God told Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars of the heaven and like the sand of the beaches of the land. And of course, the simple interpretation is that we can be very numerous. And there's so many billions and trillions and gazillions and sectillions of stars. And there's so many just billions and trillions and sectillions of granules of sand. We too, likewise, are so numerous. That's a simple interpretation. But another idea here is that we are either going to be great or we're going to be totally forgettable. You have one star, the sun, illuminates and gives life to the whole world. And we are either going to be a star or a granule of sand that people trample over. There is no room for being okay, humdrum, average, mediocre. We are going to face resistance and we are going to be given grand missions to accomplish. And what's that mission? Idea number two. We were created to fix the world. The Almighty says, okay, if there's a problem here in Egypt, let me drop the Jewish people there. Go fix it. You're done. Now it's time to hustle you over to Canaan. Along the way, maybe you'll encounter Sichon and Og, but you move from mission to mission. And the mission is to fix the world. We say in the Aleinu prayer, to fix the world with the kingdom of God. That is what Abraham started, and that legacy continues in his descendants. And idea number three is that our presence in a certain area, in a certain nation, in a certain people, in a certain locale or a region, the objective of that is to fix whatever that place's problem is. It's our job to fix it. Egypt was a place of idolatry, and that was a very difficult challenge, and we were placed there. And the spiritual conflict, the spiritual challenge that we had to face and endure and to overcome in Egypt was to rid the place of idolatry. And we did it. And thus, we were able to conquer idolatry. And we were given Torah as a gift, as a payoff once we left Egypt. This is a really intriguing idea. We know that the Jewish people remained an independent people 
in Egypt. We've spoken about this in the past. They didn't change their names. They didn't change their clothing. They remained distinct. Yet we're told that the Jewish people were sent to Egypt and they fixed Egypt. Egypt had a fundamental spiritual flaw and we came and we remedied it. How exactly did our presence change things? It's not like we interacted with them or we assimilated into them and changed them from within. What is the mechanism, if you will, of us being in a certain place and changing things? This, of course, is an interesting question to ponder. And the Kabbalists talk about the concept of gathering sparks, cleaning it up and moving on, whatever that means. As everyone knows here, I don't really know anything about Kabbalah, which is talk about a very superficial surface level. But I think... One of the ideas here is that we have no idea what happens when we improve ourselves. What happens when someone, when a human says, I want to get closer to God. I want to focus on my soul. I want to do good and improve and fix. One person can drag the whole world with them. We could be a star. How many stars does planet Earth need to have light and to have vitality and to have warmth? Only one. The Jewish people were told that we could be a star. You could be a star and one person can change the entire world. Jacob, the founding father of the Jewish people, He emanated such holiness that when he lies down, and of course the story with the ladder going up to heaven, so Rashi there says how the inanimate rocks were all jockeying to be able to support him. And the idea here is that Jacob was such a force, a beacon of holiness that that permeated his entire surroundings. The rocks that are just dead rocks, they became spiritual. One of the fundamental beliefs of our religion is that one person can change the world. And the way you do it is just by your presence. If you fix yourself, if you transform yourself, if you make yourself into a perfect person, You will fix the world. You will be like Jacob, like the sun, and you can illuminate the whole world. Jewish people are in Egypt, and the force of their holiness permeates the entire surroundings, transforms it, fixes it, and now that mission is accomplished. That box has been checked off. It's time to move other. It's time to collect our spoils, get the Torah, and move on to the next challenge. And this is true, idea number four, on an individual scale and on a national scale. The Jewish people, they are the most powerful nation of all, and therefore they're given the most difficult challenges of all. We're given Egypt, we're given Canaan, the most difficult challenges. And that's true also on an individual level. Every individual is likewise tasked with challenges fitting his or her mission. And then idea number five. There is no rest for the weary. You finish one challenge. You want to maybe take a victory lap. Celebrate it. That's great. Celebrate it. Go to Sinai. Get the Torah. And now it's time to move on to the next challenge. We go from challenge to challenge. The Jewish people are a scattered nation. We are an itinerant nation. We go from place to place. And the reason why we go from place to place is because we are signed up. This is what Abraham signed us up for. Again, so will. Challenge accepted. It's too late. Our national mandate and mission is to fix the whole world. So when you fix a certain area, you fix Egypt, it's time to move on to Canaan. And so on. And then you go to Poland and to Russia and to France and to Germany. Oh, it's time to make your pivot to go, I don't know, to Iraq, to Spain, to Tunisia, to all these other places in the world. Our influence must be everywhere. 
when we complete a mission in one place, the Almighty manipulates the circumstances to bring us to our next area of challenge, to our next frontier. Rabbi Chaim Velazhner used to say that there are 42 different encampments in the wilderness. Between when the Jewish people left Egypt until when they arrived at Arvos Moab, the plains of Moab, opposite Jericho, 42 different places they've been to. Says Rabbi Chaim Velazhner, over the course of Jewish history, the nation will dwell in 42 different countries. And afterwards, the Messiah will come, i.e., the entirety of this mission will have been completed. Continues Reb Chaim Velazhner, and he said this in the early 19th century. Where is station number 42? Where is the last of the locales of the regions of the places of the countries where the Jewish people will have to move towards, will go in exile, so to speak, towards, and perfect before the entirety of the mission is completed and we move on to the next epoch of history, i.e. the Messianic era, that is America. America! When the Jewish people come to America and we find all the sparks that are here across the fruited plain, once we accomplish the goal that we have here in this country, in the United States, that's the last frontier before Messiah. And his words were, when there's Torah flourishing in America, that's when you know Messiah is imminent. The great leader of Yeshiva Jewry, Rabbi Shach, said that when Reb Chaim Velazhner said that when there's Torah flourishing in America, that's when you know Messiah is imminent, he didn't mean when it's flourishing in New York, or New Jersey, or the tri-state area, or even Chicago, or Los Angeles, or any other big bastion of Jewish life. He meant when Torah is flourishing in Texas. When Torah flourishes in Texas, that's when we know that we are nearing the end of station number 42, And I'm getting a little emotional here. As I sit in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, I hope that we are doing a small part in ushering the world to its next challenge, to its next frontier and the Messianic era. And of course, this, like we said, applies on a communal level, but it also applies on an individual scale. And that is that you finish one challenge, you go to the next one. You want to take your victory lap? You want to celebrate your successes? Great. Enjoy the triumphs. Collect the plaudits. But we have to remember that we are here to work. And we must not slip into a passive mindset. In our spiritual lives, there's no such a thing as retirement. You know, Nobel Prize winners their productivity and creativity dips after they get the reward. And the likely reason for that is because that signals a change in mindset. You've done it. You've accomplished whatever it is that you're here to accomplish. And that's a terrible thing. Because once you transition to a mindset of passivity, You start basking in the glory of yesterday's accomplishment. You say, you know what? I conquered Egypt. That's it. I'm done. You're leaving so much work and so many accomplishments undone on the table because you have checked out. That's big idea number five. No rest for the weary. We go from challenge to challenge. Big idea number six is that each locale has a different kind of challenge. The nature of the challenge in Egypt is that of idolatry. You fix that, you collect the sparks, you move on, you have Sichon and Og, and the challenge there is murder. You go to Canaan, and the challenge is licentiousness. You go to Edom, i.e. the current challenge, that encapsulates all. It's this amalgam of the three cardinal sins, the baseless hatred, and the Lashon Hara. There's an amazing Arizal on why we cannot move back to Egypt. 
And he says this point. We were sent to Egypt to gather up those sparks to accomplish the spiritual goal, to overcome the spiritual challenge of Egypt. And when we left, when we finished, we left with great wealth, i.e. we cleaned house. And we took all the benefits of Egypt. We gathered them up. We fixed whatever needed to be fixed. And there's nothing left there to be done. And therefore, says the Arizal, we were commanded to never return to Egypt because a Jew doesn't belong there. You go back to Egypt, that signals that you want to go revel in past successes. It's done. There's nothing left for you to do there. The mission was accomplished. It was done by Moshe, of course. It was done perfectly. There's nothing left for a Jew to seek out in Egypt. Whatever it is that we need to do there has been accomplished. And now we must move on to the current challenge. Concludes the Arizal when the Jewish people gather the sparks, which we translate as fix the problems of all 70 nations. Then we arrive at the Messianic era and we transition to the next epic of history. Big idea number seven is that the conquest of each challenge yields a payoff that is commensurate to the challenge itself. After Egypt, we got Torah. After Canaan, we get the temple. And of course, you imagine, after we finish the current challenge, Adon, we get Messiah and all that comes with that. And finally, idea number eight is that the conquest of Egypt under Moshe was total, and therefore it was complete, it was permanent, we mustn't go back there. And this is an important motif that we see in many places in Jewish philosophy, that whatever Moshe did was complete. He gave us the Torah, he brought the Torah down from heaven, the Torah will never be forgotten. He built the Mishkan, or he oversaw the construction of the Mishkan. The Mishkan was never destroyed. The temples were destroyed, but not the Mishkan. And this is very relevant to the whole back and forth that we read about in the book of Deuteronomy about Moshe wanting to enter the land and God saying, no, you may not cross over the Jordan. One of the central components of that equation is the fact that whatever Moshe did was complete and permanent. And thus, had Moshe led the conquest of Canaan, the Jewish people would never lose it. And that was something that the Almighty said cannot happen because there's going to come a point in time where the Jewish people are not going to deserve it and it's going to be the right thing for them to be exiled from the land. But if they conquer the land under you, everything that you do is complete and permanent and they'll never be able to lose it. What a fantastic piece. Again, I just, I'm developing such an affinity for this book, for this Fas MS. Every piece is just jam-packed with gold. And there's no, there's no fat on the bone, as we say. It's just amazing. And it's written so tersely, so succinctly, just an absolute pleasure. So what's the lesson for us? I think the lesson is that this is really the story of the Jewish people at large, but it's also the life of every individual. The Jewish people are placed with the Egyptians the worst, the Canaanites the worst, because that is a challenge that you could do. The greater your capacity, the greater the challenge that you will be given. The Talmud tells us, this is in the same place in the Talmud that we mentioned earlier, the book of Sukkah, page 52a, Kal ha-gadol mechavero yitzro gadol himenu. Whoever is greater than his fellow has a greater yitzahara. The greater you are, the more potential that you have, the greater the challenges that you are going to be given. As Jews, we know that we are Navy SEALs. We are the Almighty's all-stars. The most difficult missions are given to us. You have hard challenges, but that's precisely because you were designated and designed to be great. This reminds me of the great JFK speech in Houston, where he said, We choose to go to the moon in this decade and to do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. 
forgive my Boston accent, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Big ambitions, big dreams, big accomplishments must pass through the crucible of big challenges, of stiff resistance. Putting a man on the moon is hard. But our nation has an even more ambitious goal to fix the entire world, to fill the world with knowledge of God as water fills the seabed, to bring about a time of universal righteousness and kindness and piety, to make the whole world testify to God's existence and omnipotence. That's way harder than landing someone on the moon, or Mars for that matter. That's a big challenge! But that's what we were created to do. And we are given that challenge because we can do it. And that's a national mission. But each one of us individually, we have a slice of that collective national mission. A small portion of it is given to us as individuals. But even a small sliver of that gargantuan role is enormous. How can we do it? The answer of course, as the Almighty gave us the manual called Torah and Mitzvos, and that's how we do it. It's a very rigorous and demanding manual. It's a very difficult way of life. But our mission is really big. And like JFK said, we don't choose to do it because it's easy. We chose to do it because it's hard. That was even a worse imitation. Forgive that. It's hard. And that's why we were given it. But we must be encouraged by the knowledge that to the degree of the effort and to the degree of the challenge, that is the degree of the path that comes afterwards. Had we not been through the crucible of Egypt, there's no way to get the greatest gift of all we would not have gotten the Torah. And when you finish one challenge, you move on to the next one. Our mission ends when we turn in the keys after 100 years, after 120 years, after 150 years in this world. That's when we're done. It's hard. Congratulations. The Almighty believes in you and gave you the most difficult of challenges. It seems insurmountable. That is the greatest testament that you have been endowed with unusual, uncommon abilities. Greater people are given bigger problems and bigger challenges. The best detectives are put in the most difficult cases. If you have a difficult problem, if your mission seems to be particularly difficult, you must know for sure that you are extremely gifted and that the Almighty expects a great deal of you. Good luck with your mission. Okay, let's get to this week's A and Q. Answers and questions. And here is the week's question. Chapter 18, the aforementioned chapter 18, tells us about a very long list of forbidden relationships that are prohibited. These are the ways of the Canaanites. These are immoral, improper, prohibited for us. And the Ramban here, he talks about how there are 36 prohibitions that carry with it the punishment of kares, of being disenfranchised and cut off from the Jewish people. And many of those 36 are sexual crimes. Moreover, the Ramban again calculates that there are 16 different capital crimes of the sexual nature. Whereas if you look at the forbidden foods, there's no forbidden foods that carry with it capital punishment. And the reason for it, says the Ramban, is because this area of sin is so repugnant in the eyes of the Torah 
and therefore it's treated so severely. And he quotes the Talmud that says that the God of these people, i.e. the God of the Jewish people, hates licentiousness. And that's why it carries, or this class of sin carries such harsh penalties. And here's the sweet question. Why, indeed, is it so bad? After all, if you're dealing with consenting adults, no one really gets hurt. Why, indeed, is this class of sin treated so severely, punished so harshly? The mind says, the reason why it's punished harshly is because God really hates it, because it's really severe. But why? Why is this particular kind of sin so severe? If you have an answer, send me an email, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. Okay, last week we asked a little bit of a difficult question. And the question was, just to simplify it, the question was, when it talks about the sacrifices of a woman who just gave birth, it says the sacrifice that she brings, and then it says, this is the law, the Torah of a woman who has a baby. And then afterwards it says, well, if she cannot afford a sheep, she brings instead two birds because there is a carve-out for a poor mom. And the question is, why does it have the encapsulatory verse after, so to speak, a rich mom, a rich woman who just gave birth, but before a woman who gives birth who cannot afford a larger, more expensive animal? So this is a difficult question. I did see some of the commentaries talk about it. But I want to share with you all uh, an answer that I came up with. But I want to give really the credit to my dad. My dad, he should live and be well. He once told me the following. A lot of people are nervous to have children because of the financial burdens entailed with having a child. It's very expensive to raise a child. Got to pay for all kinds of things, diapers and baby food. If you are fortunate enough to send your child to a Torah day school, that's very expensive. You send him to Jewish summer camp, even more expensive. Another mouth to feed with kosher food, even more expensive. So a lot of people, they feel like they don't have the wherewithal, the financial ability to have another child. Seems like it's a legitimate concern. What are you supposed to do? How can you bring another child to this world? You don't have a ways to pay for it. Is that a legitimate concern or not? So a father told me, he said, when the Almighty sends you a child, he sends with the child, with the baby, a satchel of money as well. If the Almighty can give you a child, he's also going to give you the ability to raise that child with dignity, you'll have the money to cover it. Meaning, the idea here is that had you not had that child, you would have had less money. And because you have a child, the Almighty is going to increase your income and make sure you have the ability to pay for all the newfound expenses. That is wisdom from my dad. If so, perhaps we can suggest that all the other sacrifices that talk about, hey, if you're rich, you can pay for X. If you're poor, you pay for Y. In all those cases, there's nothing that happens to a person that results in a bump at their income. And therefore, you have rich people, you have poor people. And sometimes there's someone who's poor. It's unfortunate. We don't like it when people don't have the ability to pay for things. But the Torah has a carve-out for them. Here's a cheaper sacrifice that you could bring. It's much more affordable for you. But when a woman who has a baby and she brings a sacrifice, inherent in having a child, concomitant with bearing another child, he said, the mighty is going to send you more money. And therefore, after it talks about the quote-unquote rich mom who has a baby, it says, this is the Torah, this is the law. Because inherent in having a child is being given a bump in income. And the fact that a woman who has a child does not have money 
that is something so unusual, and that's almost like added as an afterthought. And in fact, if you even look at the verse, it doesn't say that a woman doesn't have the money to afford a more expensive animal. It says, if she does not find one, which maybe we can read as saying or implying that she does have the money, it's just not available for whatever reason, and therefore we have this additional law that's very unlikely to be needed of what to do in such an instance. Do you buy it? Do you like this answer? Wisdom from my dad. If you don't like it, send him an email. No, I'm joking. Send me an email if you don't like it or if you do like it. RabbitWalmaJima.com I thank you for listening to this week's edition of The Parsha Podcast. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're having a fabulous week. I hope you have an incredible Shabbos. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.